It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. Joining us is Ambassador Thomas Pickering. Over a diplomatic career lasting five decades, he represented the United States government in a succession of the world's most complicated geopolitical hotspots, Russia, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, and Jordan. Early in his career, Pickering was an aide to Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. During the first Bush presidency, he was ambassador to the United Nations and a central figure during the first Gulf War in coordinating an international response to Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. In the Clinton years, he was ambassador first to India and then in Moscow. During the rocky transition from the era of the Soviet Union to today's Russian Federation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Doug, very much. We're fortunate to have an hour of your time. Let's go right back to the time that you were at the United Nations at the time of the first Persian Gulf War. How is it that we got things so right, seemingly, then, and then got things so wrong a decade later? There were two or three things that were very important. One was that the world was changing. And so the Soviet Union and China were moving toward a changed situation and were prepared to join us. It was an overt, outright act of unprovoked aggression, one state against another. The international community saw that, and particularly the small states, and therefore they were encouraging. President Bush had been at the UN, and he knew that it was important to have the legitimacy of the Security Council behind him as he moved to deal with that question from the perspective of the American Congress. And so that was extremely important as well. Uh, I was particularly lucky in a way uh, that we developed very early a strategy for dealing with the resolutions uh, that in effect never left us a day without a focus in the Security Council on Iraq until we had succeeded in passing the last resolution on use of force. And so that was important. Uh, we wanted to make the members, and they included Cuba and Yemen, to feel they had the most important responsibilities in the world at that time, and we succeeded. And finally, I was very lucky with George Bush and Jim Baker. Both of them, in effect, worked the phones. Both of them worked their colleagues and friends. Jim saw every foreign minister before we voted on the use of force resolution. But we did 12 resolutions to put Iraq in a position where, in fact, if it was going to comply, it could make it clear. What are the lessons to be drawn from the process that you just described, that methodical assembling of international support, versus the, what appeared to be the approach, you weren't there at the time, uh, but what appeared to be the approach uh, when we launched our second invasion of Iraq without the kind of international coalition that you played such a part in building? I watched it carefully, and many of the factors that I pointed to as being favorable to us in the first Gulf War were opposite to us in the second. It was a war of choice. It was very clear that the arguments which we advanced convinced very few people that there wasn't indeed a necessity for the use of force, or indeed that we had exhausted all of the peaceful methods of solving the problem before we jumped in with the use of force. That was a very significant piece. Russia was in a different position. Uh, so was France, interestingly enough, although they talk on both sides of their mouth right now about exactly what they were prepared to do. Finally, we went first to the Congress and second to the UN, rather than going to the UN, which in the first Gulf War established a predicate for very reluctant Democratic senators who were very concerned about another Vietnam in Iraq uh, to join in supporting a Republican president to use force under the aegis of the UN Security Council. 
And so you're describing a, an attitude of, of extreme restraint, really, or of, of caution and restraint, uh, of where you have the greatest power in the world imposing upon itself a fairly complex set of, of conditions, uh, and then a decade later, a superpower that seems completely impatient with the notion of restraint. I'll tell you an interesting story, Doug. Uh, after we passed the first resolution at 4 o'clock in the morning, I went home to bed, got a call almost immediately from Brent Scowcroft and said, come to the NSC meeting beginning at 9 this morning. I hopped on a plane, got down there, sat through the meeting. It was a meeting that in which General Schwarzkopf uh, and General Powell, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, explained exactly how we were going to prevent the Iraqi forces in Kuwait from invading Saudi Arabia. All of it was simply right and splendid. At the end of the meeting, I said, hey, Mr. President, what about Kuwait? Uh, your policy hinges on your ability to make clear to the world that you're going to stand by this country which was invaded uh, and aggressed against, uh, and it will have no clarity, and it will have no basis for proceeding ahead unless you're prepared to do that. I got no answer in the meeting. Two hours later, President Bush flew uh, to Aspen, Colorado, and met Maggie Thatcher in the home of our then ambassador to the UK, Henry Cotto. Maggie scrubbed his head, uh, and they came out of that meeting saying, we are going to assure that Kuwait is set free again, and that this is our policy, and we're determined to do that peacefully if we can. If, without, we, not, if not, we, we will use military force to do that. Maggie had another idea which never perked with George. That was, let's go ahead and forget the UN Security Council. Let's just run down this road and we'll do it ourselves and we'll bring our own coalition together. Happily, that was important and he knew that because he knew he didn't have enough Democrats uh, to get what he needed to have in the Senate uh, to produce the resolution to engage US military forces. And so it was a very interesting, very chancy arrangement. And not everybody was on the same copybook, but there were enough people on enough right sides of the copybook, if I could put it this way, to get the policy right. But so what you describe sounds like that a decade later, we end up taking them something much closer to the Margaret Thatcher approach uh, that she was recommending at the time with consequences that are at best very muddled now. But what's the lesson to be drawn from this? It's one thing that, that to observe that things went so much better then, but what is it that as Americans we need to draw from all of that to, and to try to impose on whatever question faces us next? The lesson is that use of military force internationally is coming under a more restricted environment as time goes on. That while we are not slavishly adherent to the UN Charter, it provides only two ways to use military force. In self-defense or to come to the aid of somebody in self-defense, and that's almost ipso facto understood. Or you go to the Security Council and you get a resolution that authorizes you to use force to deal with the problem of international peace and security. Uh, this has put us in more of a box than I think we want to be in, but it is where the international trend is going. So if you then think about using force and you haven't got substantial basis for pleading self-defense, then you at least need to consider going to the Security Council. Uh, President George W. Bush did on the arguments uh, of, of Secretary Powell. Uh, they failed uh, to do that. That left the question of legitimacy hanging in the air. And it is not a comfortable question to have around your neck, uh, particularly if, in fact, the arguments you make for that use of force uh, tend to move with the time and the dimensions of the problem. First, it was weapons of mass destruction. Another was to introduce peace and democracy. Another was to get rid of a terribly bad actor, Saddam Hussein. All happy objectives, uh, but not those that had the backing and support of an international community, which as leader of the international community, it was almost incumbent upon us to get. So the, the other factor is we have the role of leading. Everybody wants us to lead, whether they dislike us intensely or not. 
Um, and in leading, we have the success or failure of our ability to bring the international community along in where we're going. So it requires careful decision making. It requires what I would call implementation by steps which seek to solve the problem before you get to the use of force. Finally, we've also learned that the use of force in Iraq and Afghanistan is not the sovereign remedy. Three drops out of the bottle, you get it all that there is this awfully difficult problem of how you pick up the pieces after combat, how you help shape a new government, who runs it, where do they come from, what are the contending factors domestically in that country, how do the outside players deal with it, hugely complicated. And so while some, I believe, saw the use of force was a shortcut to diplomacy, and diplomacy is long, and it is not certain, and it takes time, and it takes building leverage, uh, and force is important in that leverage. Uh, the use of force sometimes puts us in a position where we don't yet think through the next steps of what we do when that's done, and that's very challenging. Finally, I feel once you begin to use force as a shortcut for diplomacy, and you fail because you don't have what I call the back end of the problem, dealt with effectively, then you're undermining the effectiveness of the use of force. But you're also undermining the effectiveness of the force which you have, along with your economy and your political principles, to back up your diplomacy, which in many ways is a kind of spiral of unhappiness and disintegration and failure, rather than the other way around. And these are all carefully linked. So I think George H.W understood this, and so did Brent Scowcroft and Jim Baker, and they pursued this in a very careful, stepwise way. Uh, they were criticized for not trying sanctions long enough. On the other hand, they knew over a period of time that their capacity to keep the coalition together depended upon working through a paradigm uh, that was time limited and was going to be effective in the field. And so they combined these things in a stepwise process to make it happen. And so it seems that one of the lessons also that, that comes from that is that at a time when we generally seem to have less confidence in the United Nations as an institution today and see it as a declining or maybe even irrelevant body, that actually the hassle of submitting to a process in which other people who may well disagree with the United States and may raise objections actually turns out to be a pretty fruitful thing to do. It does if you can make it work for you. It doesn't if you cannot make it work for you. There's no question at all that at times the international community can be mobilized. And at times it's the heinousness of the act. But there are times when we fail. We failed in Rwanda. We are failing in Congo, where we have a slow genocide of even greater proportions than Rwanda. We are failing in other areas. Um, and part of that is convincing Russia, which is a member of the Security Council, to go along. For years, Doug, I have thought that the veto in these cases worked against American interest because it was in our interest, certainly in the case of genocide, to use the Security Council to legitimate forward movement. There was a time back at the end of the Cold War when I thought we could persuade the new Russia, and through them China, to agree that maybe you needed three vetoers to make it effective in the case of genocide. That never happened. It wasn't easy. The U.S. was very chary about fiddling with the veto because they saw this as the sheet anchor to windward in nautical terms, and they didn't want to in any way hazard it coming off the bottom, if I could call it that. And so it was, a, it was a very interesting thing. But over a period of time, something has to be done in the United Nations. Um, we can't have a situation where political differences uh, of a philosophical, doctrinal, and in some cases, historical character predetermine the outcome. That was the problem of the Cold War in the Security Council. Now we're having a problem of what I would call the Russian standoff in the Security Council. Happily, the Russians have come along pretty well on Iran, so it isn't total. Uh, 
But it is a problem and a challenge in American diplomacy of significance, particularly when you get down to the question of the use of force. I myself believe use of force in questions in times of choice is not wise. You want to be sure you're using it either in self-defense or will you have a good, solid reason saleable to most of the international community to engage in it, and then you want to build a coalition. You don't want to be there alone. You want to make those kinds of approaches so that, in fact, we are working with and through the international community. It's hard to do, um, but it can be done. You mentioned a moment ago that the, in the first Gulf War that it was the correct decision not to go to Baghdad, the, the restraint that was then shown even after the invasion. Uh, it seems to me there's not enough discussion these days when we look at the current situation uh, that the decision not to go to Baghdad at the time, even though that looked pretty bad uh, from a lot of perspectives, particularly when there was an insurrection after the fighting and the United States didn't particularly support these folks. A lot of them got slaughtered in pretty terrible ways. There, there was some what seemed like pretty legitimate criticism. On the other hand, we now see in the present times the effects of completely destabilizing such a large population in the whole region. Uh, and so it seems that the best case for not going to Baghdad and leaving Saddam Hussein in place back then is what we now see, that in the absence of him, we have the Islamic State and all that has followed. It's not all inevitable. It's not necessarily I I immutable. At the end of the Gulf War, I and a small team in New York proposed that the areas of Iraq that were pure desert be occupied by the Allies up against the line of population along the river system. So it would be mostly Anbar up into Syria. That was refused by our military because they didn't want to take on the burden. But by that time, the French and the British both agreed with me they would provide the ground forces, among others, and we'd have to provide the air. That didn't work but it would have put us close to the people who were in pushing against Saddam and in a position to be much more influential early. That may have helped us avoid going in later, I don't know. But in effect, having done that and failed, uh, we were then left in a situation where Saddam could exploit the situation. He exploited something called oil for food by importuning friends and allies to come over to his side because he could ration out the food uh, to his own people and make it appear as if it was we who were starving him, them to death. And so you went through all of that awful period. Um, and in the end, my own view was Saddam was not a threat to the United States. He was not palpably then a threat to the region. We were there among others. And the notion of trying to take him on under those circumstances would in effect put a stick into the bee's nest and turn it around many times um, and we would be likely to get stung. I had no sense at all that, risk, that sending young American troops into the back streets of Baghdad under Saddam Hussein uh, to engage in street fighting to liberate something that we had really no idea of how to govern or how to deal with was a wise idea. And throughout that whole period, my sense has been deeply that all of the elements that have now popped up, uh, Sunni disappointment, uh, Shia, put it this way, overawing, uh, Kurdish hunkering down, uh, the opportunity of more radical Sunnis to come into northern Iraq and sweep it by storm, we're all there in one way or another. We were just sitting by waiting to watch it happen, unfortunately. And now we have an even bigger problem in some ways, and a problem that we are going to try to face through recruiting Iraqi ground forces. And if you read your daily newspaper, you will find that those ground forces are riddled with corruption, unwilling to fight, not very aggressive, in the meantime, they've created uh, Shia militias who are in many ways the opposite number to ISIL or ISIS uh, and engage in killings. And so we have now created a battlefield of radicals against radicals with no deference to humanity or human rights. Where are we going to end up on this? I don't see it very clearly. Our bombing has helped to stave off
uh, the loss of a town in northern Syria and helped to turn the tide in a few places. But without reliable, significant ground forces, which General Allen believes he won't be able to mobilize for a year, uh, we are not going to get somewhere in that very difficult problem. We're going to have to have a great deal of patience. You just said, uh, I believe, we have created a battlefield featuring these two forms of extremists. We have created. Is that the right way to, to say it? Is this, do we have to take some responsibility that uh, specifically, obviously, that this situation is significantly a creation of United States activity in that part of the world? Of course we have to, Doug. Be between 2003 and 2011, or whenever we got out, we had the predominant role in the country. Um, and we failed to do the things that we have to do, particularly on the political side of the equation, particularly with the Maliki government, in saying to them, you can have majority rule, but you've got to have minority rights. And there's no way you can run this country with the tripartite divisions that you have between the ethnicities and the religions uh, without opening the door to some participation. Uh, and that was not in their mind. It was not in their copybook. It was not in their culture. It was not in their background. Um, and so we didn't pay attention to any of these things when we got in. I can recall that friends of mine in the State Department, I was out, uh, prepared a, a long briefing book, a 100-page document, I sent it over to the Defense Department to treat exactly these problems. And for whatever reasons, uh, the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, said, get rid of it. Don't read it. It's not yours. It's not what we're going to do. Uh, and so all of the people who knew that part of the Arab world, who had served there, been paid to obviously become expert on it, were kind of tossed to the winds. And we had this kind of Hollywood view that if we won the combat, then somebody like Ahmed Shalabi would come forward and the film would be us marching hand in hand off into the sunset right away. And it was obviously uh, naive in the, to the greatest extent possible. Well, naive is the word. And I, 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 I tire actually of hearing myself pound on these questions, but I find myself so frustrated by the obsession almost, the compulsion of Americans by and large in a situation like we have today to focus on the savagery of terrible people and the savage things that they do and that we now see them doing on, in, on the internet and, and the, these terrible events, we overwhelmingly focus on the failures of these terrible people and there's no doubt that they are terrible and what they're doing is absolutely savage, but it is so difficult for Americans to make the turn and say to ourselves or realize the, that the role that we played in destabilizing this world uh, in a way that allowed these savage people to begin to do and encouraged these savage people to begin doing these things. I despair that we seem to draw no lessons as a people from these things and now are stumbling forward into new actions that I think we really don't know the outcomes of either. Well, Doug, the lessons are not easy. And I would be the last person to say that this isn't rocket science in one way or another. We have to have a deep understanding of culture and language. We have to have a very deep sense that we play Saturday afternoon football, so winners and losers, particularly by five o'clock, are an important attribute of our own culture in many ways. We don't believe that there are pro problems that we cannot solve, and that's very hard. Uh, it's a particularly gripping difficulty. Uh, we understand that time is money and valuable, and therefore patience is a virtue for grandma, but not for us. Uh, and therefore, we want to move ahead very rapidly and get an instant satisfaction. We have uh, a media, uh, both new and old, that is in many ways influenced by these virtues. One only has to go back and look across the sweep of reporting. We have a political system that is in many ways super polarized right now, that in fact it makes uh, leaders vulnerable uh, to comments and criticism based on traditional American approaches and attitudes. That leading from behind is not American. 
as much as it may have some wisdom. But leading from behind has to be leading all of the time, not just in the combat phase as it was in Libya, uh, and very difficult. We have to learn when do we go to use force uh, and when do we have to stand back? And that's a very trying question. No president wants to say that he's sitting by while hundreds of thousands of people are being massacred. On the other hand, no president at this stage wants to go to war with Russia over Crimea at a place where our capacities to exercise and use military influence are quite limited. I remember back in the Cold War days, Berlin in 56, certainly Budapest in 56, in Prague in 68, in many of the same circumstances. Uh, we're looked at as world leaders, but we are not capable of solving every world problem. Uh, and when to take the risks and when not to take the risks are tremendously significant issues. And they have a huge role in our domestic political life. And so in the vein of problems we possibly can't solve, uh, what's your answer to the, the argument that now that we've destabilized this place, Syria and Iraq and the, and the surrounding areas, that we've equalized in some respects the various parties and forces. We don't have a Saddam Hussein who has all the cards and the ability to invade his neighbors or, or massacre huge numbers of his population. We've broken all that up. Why don't we let them fight it out? We can't solve this problem. Why do we have to try to stop them? Let them decide on the borders of their countries. Unlike we, we set these borders colonially, our, our side did a long time ago. Why not give the fight back to them? You know, that's becoming a potentially important argument. And it's not one that I could find it easy lightly to dismiss. But the arguments over on the other side are certainly the energy question. Iraq has now improved its energy production maybe three times since the low. It's a very important player in the new world of energy. Uh, prices are going down, which is not necessarily the greatest punishment we've ever inflicted on ourselves. Uh, it's important for us to understand that stability in the region can move. Uh, it can move uh, as it has from Syria to Iraq, back into Syria. It can move to Jordan. Uh, Lebanon is certainly very shaky. Uh, Egypt is recovering in a way that I'm not happy with, uh, but from a bout of kind of revolutionary change which never moved in any kind of positive direction for any of us. Uh, and so the whole stew uh, is in a very messy circumstance. Uh, and whether we like it or not, we have obligations. We have obligations to our Arab friends. We have obligations to Israelis, certainly to provide stability. And we can talk more about some of the concomitants and some of the difficulties of this. So it's not so easy to walk away uh, if, in fact, you see some of these playing. Harry Truman years ago said that we have only two vital interests, survivability and prosperity. And I suppose in some ways they're linked. Um, and I suppose that it attaches to our close allies as well. Uh, and so almost every problem in the Middle East with few exceptions, maybe an Iranian nuclear weapon is one of them, is not in that category. And so what we have been doing over the years is obviously leading and playing an important role in a lot of high priority second order questions. And we need to understand that. We don't yet have the way of how to put these in priority order. To some extent, that's dictated in my view, may be wrongly, but nevertheless ineluctably, by the way in which they're handled as they come in on the airwaves from the media uh, and the way in which attention is called to them. Uh, and every White House has felt compelled to answer every question that's come up on the day in which it is asked. And to some extent, that's begun to produce engagement by press statement as much as it has by thought process. And we have to begin to figure out how to do that. Finally, and this is another point, we're afflicted by the notion that so much of the daily business of government and foreign affairs and security has consumed so many of the people that we haven't even been able to set aside 
the really brainy thinkers uh, to begin to look down the road to say, what can we do as a positive set of policy alternatives to move out of these messes rather than what do we do uh, to provide the therapy necessary to survive these messes? And so that's a very difficult issue. It's always the media's fault. <laughs> well, some of it is obviously the media has the responsibility of reporting the world, and good news don't sell papers. Well, and it's also uh, a troubling thing, in a sense, to mm -hmm. see that some of the decisions being made right now, specifically uh, with regard to the Islamic State, do seem to be driven overwhelmingly by a handful of videos of yes. terrible things. And as, in as many opposed, ways, they understand the strategy and how to take advantage of the media. Now, the irony of that, of mm -hmm. course, is that had the Islamic State not put out those videos, yep. we wouldn't be bombing them right now. I mean, it's a, in the end, perhaps it's a good, uh, uh, a good recruiting uh, mechanism for them, but a very foolish one tactically and strategically, but one I, would argue. I think that's right. On the other hand, now we're now caught with the problem of what do we do in addition to bombing to deal with the problem because we know that bombing is effective but not an answer to a strategic issue, even to a tactical question. Where are the ground forces coming from and how are they going to play their role? And it's an area where it's quite clear that even other Arabs may not be welcome in the ground campaign. Uh, Saudis, uh, UAE, Qataris, uh, it may well have to come from, from inside Iraq itself and be generated by that kind of a, of a campaign. This is not to diminish in any way the extraordinary achievements of, of the diplomacy that surrounded the first Gulf War that you were involved in, but at the time of Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, it seemed like a kind of old-fashioned uh, act of aggression. It was the sort of thing that countries had done before the Cold War, uh, a stronger neighbor moving into a nearby neighbor. And so assembling an international coalition to throw back this obvious wrong was a fairly straightforward equation, at least in terms of the, the morals and principles of it. Now we're in a time where the biggest player in terms of outright aggression moving into a nearby neighbor to seize property that looks good and one feels a historical attachment to is the other great superpower or, or one-time superpower, whatever we want to call it, Russia. Yeah. Uh, so how did we end up in this in this place where an old-fashioned quaint invasion like the one that Saddam Hussein pulled off is now superseded by something that portends conflict among the superpowers. Yeah, well, there, there are two pieces here. One is, of course, it's not just the other superpower. It's non-governmental organizations of a terrorist ilk. So we have to put that on the table. But the superpower question is a very interesting one. Uh, to some extent, uh, over the years in dealing with Russia, Mr. Putin uh, has developed um, a set of attitudes and approaches to life that in many ways mirror his experience as an intelligent agent, intelligence agent of the Soviet Union in Germany. And so he believes, and there are things that he can point to that I believe are legitimate, that they have been treated as a second-class player. Uh, they've been told that uh, Ukraine and Georgia instantly have to become members of NATO when they've been deeply concerned about it and, and made it clear that they've been deeply concerned about it. Uh, they were told that the anti-ballistic missile treaty, uh, which we convinced the Russians or the Soviets was the right thing to do because it added real stability to the nuclear equation, was now going to be denounced by the United States with no replacement to deal with the potential that we would develop an anti-ballistic missile system that would negate the effectiveness of their offensive system, which they've worried about. Way down the road, but nevertheless, they saw this coming along. So they saw this as a new effort. They saw their economy as so weak. At one point, their economy was like Hungary's. And they saw themselves treated as second-class players. In the meantime, they felt, look, we have the only nuclear arsenal that ever threatens the United States. And why aren't we players at the main table? Why do we keep getting dissed? Why do we keep getting told that the U.S. is going to do this without much consultation and expectation that Russia will come along? And there are lots of those. So that's the Putin side of the equation. 
Putin in 2011 slid in the elections and was shocked. So that combination of sliding in his own domestic popularity and the fact that people were out on the streets in Moscow and around Russia in 2012 and beyond, and this notion that he was being relegated to secondary or even tertiary status behind China, all brought home to him that he had to have a new way of dealing with it. Now, Putin, in my view, is a good tactical thinker, but he's weak on strategy. So his tactical approach was to fix on two or three things. One, creation of a sphere of influence for Russia in the former area of the Soviet Union, both political and economic through a customs union. Secondly, to snap off when he could pieces of Russian inhabited territory that were part of his view of what was the real Russia and do that in a way to send a message to us and others that he was a player, that he was back on the scene, that he had to be dealt with and that this was important. Thirdly, to emphasize in his whole national efforts, nationalism built around these steps. And finally, to kick ankles at the U.S. whenever he could as a way of asserting the fact that he was equal to, aware of, and ready to confront the United States as a part of Russian nationalism. So this was the buildup. This was the denouement, of, in effect, of where he is. Strategically, what he failed to do was use all of his oil money to diversify Russia's economy. So Russia is dependent on a monocrop export, hydrocarbons. Uh, we are dependent in Europe on importing Russian hydrocarbons. Until we can change the equation, we don't have the seminal kind of influence in Russia that can get us back to talking. Talking is very important, despite the fact that it seems like blah, blah. Winston Churchill said, jaw, jaw, not war, war. And I think he was right. People who see Putin often say he is begging to have a conversation, that he wants to talk, that he's open to do it. I don't know how much of that is basically naivete and reality. My own formula is very clear. We must ratchet up the sanctions, and we must get with Europe on its energy dependence. But at the same time, it is an imperative in diplomacy that we frame the doors through which we want Mr. Putin to walk through as we create this effort. And one of those has to be in Ukraine. And Ukraine's big fundamental underlying problem that led to the, put it this way, the creation of the present mess was the failure of the Ukrainian economy to perform consistently over the years. And there was a contest between Russia and the EU as to who could become the best friend of Ukraine. But that will help shape the future. I don't mind asking Russia to put money in the Ukrainian economy, along with the EU, the US, and the IMF, as a way of going ahead. Even more, we should define Ukraine as a bridge country, not a NATO country, but not a adherent to an affiliate uh, of the Russia that we now see today. But it should be somewhere in between. It should be open for trade in both directions. These are difficult, but they can be done. It should be a country where Ukrainian supranationalism gives way uh, to the obvious necessity to have in the Ukraine minority rights for the Russian speakers in a way that recognizes their legitimacy and their role. If Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama were at the table, this would be a much more interesting conversation uh, if they replaced me, uh, but if they were having a conversation with you, I think that they would say that that's what we were doing, Ambassador, when we said we want to reset the relationship with Putin. Uh, that's what we got castigated for uh, back in the United States by our political enemies, and that's what we got very little from Vladimir Putin in return for. And so how do we go back to that same approach of resetting the relationship on a, on a different set of terms? Part of the going back is that we structure the conversation and the circumstances surrounding the conversation with the sanctions and with increased pressure. Secondly, we'd be prepared to talk with the, about the worst case as well as the best case of where things are going at the present time. 
Next, we need to lay on the table what we're prepared to do uh, to make this happen. This may not work. Uh, Putin believes we're a dying country, that we're failing, that we're not going to last. Uh, to some extent, uh, he has fastened on ephemera to do that. But I think we need to be very strong in talking to him about how we can move questions ahead. I have to tell you that our internal political developments don't lead me to believe that that's going to be our strongest lead point. Mm -hmm. Our economic recovery will be. I also think that we have paid, played fast and loose with our principles too often. In Abu Ghraib, in Guantanamo, in detainee treatment, in a whole lot of things. And we need to come back, and the president hasn't yet picked up the cudgel. Uh, I don't care if they prosecute somebody for misbehavior. It would be logical, but it's not the imperative. The imperative is to put in place things that assure that these violations of humanity and our own traditions and history don't take place again. Let's just make sure it's clear what you're saying. And I, I believe what you're saying is that if we are a country that that feels it can unilaterally invade another country yeah. on the basis of our arguments right. without international sanction, then it is difficult for us to tell Russia or any other country that they can't do the same thing. If we are a country that uh, uses enhanced interrogation techniques to extract information from people we capture, then it is difficult for us to, to criticize the same behavior. Uh, and, and a general sense that we have diminished our position in the world, which is exactly what President Obama promised us he was going to rectify when he was elected. But, but that's what you're saying, is that we've given up moral high yes, ground. Yes, Doug, that's the Pulitzer Prize answer to your question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Interestingly, you were describing a moment ago Putin's narrative uh, of, of how things got to where yep. they are, and, and you seem to give it some credence. You weren't, you weren't describing it as a completely uh, fabulous thing. Uh, part of that narrative is that in the 1990s uh, that Russia is humiliated by the West and, and forced into agreements that were bad for it, ultimately. Uh, we were recently talking with Angela Stent, sitting in the same yep. chair, about this, the parallels between this and Weimar Germany and how the, how the, uh, the, the, the penalties placed on Germany uh, after World War I had put it in a position that, that helped to uh, lead to it becoming a dangerous player on the world stage. But that period of time in the 1990s when so much of that is happening is when you're the ambassador yes. uh, in Moscow. So what, what gives? What's the explanation? I left in 96. I felt up until then we had worked very closely with Yeltsin, that we had tried to understand him and what he needed. There was no question at all that President Clinton had a remarkable relationship with President Yeltsin. And that over time, while President Yeltsin did things that from time to time he told his people he didn't want to do, he had a remarkable capacity when he and Clinton got together to work out the answer and then to use the press conference for Yeltsin to open it up and say, I've achieved a new foreign policy victory. And he sold that. Uh, subsequent to that, he went into decline. He had his heart operation, turned things over to Putin. I think things soured. And I think the next administration built into the sourness uh, an even greater set of difficult activities. And so most of it probably didn't come in the 90s so much as it came in the first decade of the new century. Uh, and there are some of the things that you talked about, that we have talked about, the invasion of Iraq, uh, the kinds of steps that we took on various treaties, those kinds of things, which sat very heavily on the Russian head. They sat very heavily on Mr. Putin's head. Mr. Putin wasn't Yeltsin. Putin still looked back at some of the glories of the Soviet Union. He saw it as a great country. He saw remarkable feats that they had performed in science and in weapons development and in other areas. And, and indeed, there were. And, and we should, we'd be mistaken if we overlooked that. Um, but he felt that we didn't recognize that. And we felt that there was much victory talk in the United States. Uh, we tried very hard, I think, in the Clinton administration to avoid some of that. As, as did much the as the first Bush administration. And the Went first out of Bush way, administration, not to, to, not to celebrate it. Not victory. to celebrate this. And, and to say, in fact, that this was a victory of the Russian people. And I think the Soviet Union collapsed 
uh, because their economy simply undertook more than it had a capacity to carry out. They broke the iron law of economics that you in the end cannot forever spend more than you take in. Uh, and that brought them down in a way that Gorbachev saw very clearly after 85 and by 89 was struggling to try to contain and it just got away from him. And so now we have this perplexing situation in the world where on the one hand, Russia is the, in many respects, is the great malefactor of, of geopolitics of the moment. And yet at the same time, periodically pops up in ways that, whether we fully acknowledge it or not, are actually quite important and interesting. I, I mean, it's now been eclipsed by all these other events, but, uh, and the president was, was uh, ridiculed over that the intervention of Putin and Russia in the talks over chemical weapons in Syria, uh, he, we, we were ridiculed for leading from behind, yeah. in a sense. Yet in reality, what you had there was a, a real moment of realpolitik that led to the objective of the United States and the rest of the world actually being accomplished. I couldn't agree with you more. I think the notion that Assad's biggest ally would suggest he give up his best weapon as a way of avoiding American military action against him, however limited or unlimited it would be, was a remarkable shift. Uh, and a shift in which Mr. Putin was obviously caught on the horns of a dilemma. Could he let his best ally undergo a military pummeling, which he couldn't stop, Crimea in reverse in some ways, or should he seek a way to negotiate out of it and put on the table something that would indicate clearly that his thinking and our thinking were in parallel? Uh, it's sad that we couldn't begin to convert that into the next stage elements. Could we move from there to a ceasefire? Could we move from a ceasefire uh, to a transitional government? Uh, could we find a way to have maybe, as Henry Kissinger was saying, Assad in at the beginning but out at the end? You know, should we use electoral processes if you got a ceasefire? Those are all there. What are the lessons of, uh, of, of what you've just described and in which we can acknowledge that there actually is an important role of Russia to play, however odious uh, we may find Putin at a particular moment in time, but in terms of trying to move forward on some sort of a deal with Iran? Well, there's no question at all that John Kerry has worked with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, to attempt to do this. At the moment, that doesn't seem to have caught hold, in part because at the, at the moment, President Assad is not, not losing. The Russians were much more malleable the beginning of 2013 when it looked like Assad was going under. So the no-fly zone may be one way to, to, to move that along. I'm not sure. Uh, but we have to think about that because military force is there to be used, but in my view, to promote the diplomatic solution we hope to get, not to try to win the war, which is without boots on the ground, not a possibility. So I think that's significant. I think we have to continue to open the door with Iran in one way or another. This morning's news about postponement is not the worst alternative, not the best alternative. Let's see further where that can take us. But uh, Where do you see that going the, with, in terms of reaching some sort of a nuclear deal with Iran? Well, my own view is that deadlines have a useful role, and I think this one has, in producing forward progress. And the messages I get and the information I get and what I see in the press is that significant forward progress has been made. We don't know yet really what it means, uh, but we have two big hurdles to pass. How much sanctions do they get off? And how much restriction do we get on enrichment and stockpiles of, of low enriched uranium? Um, those, in my view, are difficult but not impossible. Uh, the real problem about postponement, it will give all the people who don't like an agreement plenty of chance now to operate, whether it's in the new Senate or whether it's in the Iranian Majlis or the Revolutionary Guard or whatever. Uh, to some extent, all of us who believe that they're still possible to get an agreement need to step up and say it's better, as Winston Churchill said, to talk than it is to go to some kind of set of elements that may ineluct ineluctably lead to conflict. So I think that's where we are. Um, and I think that we continue to need, to need to find ways to jump over this question. My own view has been for years that if we were to take all the sanctions off with some, put it this way, with some um, caveats, 
Uh, we could get them back any time we wanted from the U.S. side. Uh, the president only has to ask the Congress. It seems to me that we end up in this position with Iran that in some respects reminds me of, of our relationship with Cuba, where because of a singular gigantic event, we adopt a very rigid posture toward a particular country that we cannot move from over the long passage of time, even when logic and, and facts may perhaps begin to argue strongly that we should. And here we have in our recent history in that region of the world um, an ill-founded idea that if we invaded one country, uh, that the people of that country were well-educated and had some sense of friendship toward the United States and that they would welcome us with open arms, uh, when in fact there was nothing like that to be found. On the other hand, the country that we have ostracized most consistently over this whole period of time has a population of people who I believe is actually somewhat closer to that, uh, that the Iranian people themselves do have some affinity to Americans for a whole variety of historical reasons. You know, I visited Iran last 10 years ago as a tourist, and I found our relations with the Iranian people very good. They wanted to know why things were so bad with the United States. They didn't understand. They weren't getting information. Uh, and I think that, that, that that's important. And in fact, you could have said one of the great successes of George W. Bush's foreign policy was that so many people in Iran loved the United States. Exactly. Now, is that a formula for Probably future not. success? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. And it's, 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 it's counterintuitive in, in any event to say anything at all. There is a fairly widely held view that President Obama for a long time was largely uninterested in foreign affairs and geopolitics, and that once he became interested in it, that he was significantly out of his depth, and that this has not been a successful administration in terms of foreign policy. Do you ascribe to that view? No, but I think that there are elements that you can point to which give an indication that it has been a distinctly mixed record. And I think that uh, uh, there are things that he has done and that he has accomplished which he is not getting credit for, that he doesn't trumpet very much, that he is on the defensive almost across the board. But it is true that I think he's relied too heavily on too narrow a coterie in the White House, uh, very much until uh, the last midterm elections, uh, devoted to domestic issues, which he gave priority, I think quite rightly to. And as a result, very much less interested in taking risks in foreign affairs. The really interesting problem is that if you are not riding your bicycle forward in foreign affairs, you're falling down because you don't control what's coming at you. Uh, and so what's coming at you uh, either has to be anticipated and taken on or dealt with as a kind of following the horses in the horse parade and sweeping up after them. <laughs> And this is not where we want to be, but much of our foreign policy has taken the horse parade approach rather than the bicycle approach. And so there are important pieces that we have to look at. And in some ways, a president no longer has the absolute uh, ability to prioritize one set of issues over the other and still meet what I would call the requisite demands of the country, of the polity, and of the people. And that's been a little bit of what we've seen. Um, I think we have a national security system which is out of date. I do think we need a lot more use of the instruments we have built rather than a tendency to concentrate too much power and decision making and operational control in the White House. Um, and I think that until we move back to being able to employ uh, the team of rivals as operational leaders, uh, as opposed to, to merely policy suggestions, we are not getting where we're going. And maybe some of the changes coming in the Defense Department are a realization of that. One would only hope, but I don't know. In any event, um, the the question you raise is fundamental for us. Uh, where Obama can go in the next two years is far. He's got lots of problems. Middle East, China, Russia at the top. And we've talked about all but China. But he has many other things that need to do. He has to continue to mend the economy. He has to find the answer to a whole series of domestic problems. Certainly immigration, certainly guns, certainly a whole series of questions having to do with how our economy best serves 
are public and at the same time stimulates the growth, which is coming slowly, but nevertheless needs to be there. And, and I think that's out there. Uh, we have a, no, a number of opportunities with China and Russia. If we can get that uh, opening, uh, it may be that with Mr. Putin and with President Xi, we just are not able to have the kind of dialogue. But we certainly need to reach out now in the next six months to see if, in fact, we can begin to build back uh, on where we have come uh, to set some kind of new direction for the future. Wise counsel. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Former United Nations Ambassador Thomas Pickering. For more about this and other episodes of this program, visit us at millercenter.org, American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next time.